elements all coming together in what is a tradition here for the Mark Plotkin and Muriel Rosenthal Alumni Speaker Series. So welcome. Before I introduce today's speaker, I'd like to remind us all why we have this wonderful opportunity to hear from alumni speakers. Mark Plotkin, who graduated from lab in 1964, made a gift in honor of his mother, Muriel Rosenthal. She insisted that he attend U High, not only because she thought it would make him a more educated person, but because she thought it would make him a better person. Mr. Plotkin, who was the class of 1964, began a career as a journalist and political commentator. He's worked on political campaigns for NPR and other radio stations, and as a columnist for The Hill and The Georgetown. Last year, he was here to talk about his own experience at LAB, to talk about his mother and honor his mother, which this is intended to do, and he actually introduced last year's speaker. Mark, this year, was unable to be with us but wanted to send his wishes and to remind you that you are the future alumni of the school and that as such, he hopes that you, as part of this series, think about how you might be coming back to lab and visiting the school in different capacities in the years that you leave. I have the pleasure today of introducing Ms. Linda Johnson Rice. Linda graduated from LAB in 1975 and one is, is one of our most distinguished alum. She's also the mother of another student who graduated, who I'm sure is going to be coming and giving a speech sometime as well. You agree? Well, I can't promise that. <laughs> <laughs> Ms. Johnson Rice is chairman and CEO of Johnson Publishing Company, owner of the global beauty brand for women of color, Fashion Fair Cosmetics and more than seven decades of archival images and videos chronicling the African-American experience through the pages of Ebony and Jet magazines. As Chairman Emeritus and co-owner of Ebony Media Operations and Ebony Media Holdings, her influence spans business editorial from planning the strategic direction of the global beauty brand to setting the tone of Heritage magazines. I think while she's the successful businesswoman and leader it's also important to know how much time she's given to civic activities in Chicago and more broadly, serving on a number of boards. She's a member of the council member of the Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture, Northwestern Memorial Corporation, a trustee at the Art Institute here in Chicago, and president of the Chicago Public Library Board of Directors. So while having her day job, she does much more than her day job, and in those other contributions has really contributed to the city that we get to enjoy in many of the civic institutions that are here as part of Chicago. So I want to welcome her, give a big round of applause for her being with us today. meeting of her was at a classmate friend of mine from high school who lives here in Chicago. We were at the same birthday party, and uh, she's a fun person to be at a birthday party. So, welcome. And uh, we're going to have time for questions uh, as well uh, at the end. Um, and I need my cheaters because I can't see a job on the thing. But I, I do have to say thank you for taking the time and thank you for the, the invitation. It's uh, really great to be um, back here in such a wonderful place where I have so many unbelievable memories. This uh, Gordon Parks Arts Hall that I got a chance to tour earlier really brings to mind to me how eloquently and how often the legendary photographer's work graced the pages of Ebony and Jet magazines. So it all kind of comes full circle for me. Um, as I was walking through, I was reminiscing about all the wonderful teachers that I, I had here, the social studies teacher, gosh, I had Mr. Bell, and Mr. Bernstein, Ms. Wheeler, one of my favorite teachers, Ms. 
Bliss. I mean, they all really pushed me and encouraged me and challenged me academically. And I think those are the experiences that really helped me be who I am. I, I have to say that lab influenced what I believe in and how I see and how I treat people in the world today. I do want to thank and offer my gratitude to the students and the faculty, and to Charlie, of course, for inviting me to be the keynote speaker today. I think this is the fifth year that he said that we've, we've done this, so that is wonderful. And you all really should thank Mark Plotkin tremendously for, for providing this opportunity for you. I do want to also thank um, Irene Reed. I don't think she's in here. She's probably back at her desk working, our director of admissions, who led me on the guided tour um, earlier this morning, I have to tell you, I would have been completely lost without her. Um, when I pulled up here and I stepped into Judd Hall, it really kind of blew my mind, because I could not believe how different it looked. It is, it's almost unrecognizable for someone who's been away for so many years. But I, I want to tell you that I love what's been done as I was going through what's been going on in the counseling department. Um, I was talking, I had sort of a, a pre-meeting uh, last week um, via Skype with some students, and they were talking about how they've reconfigured the offices and the counseling area that's much more welcoming, and you all know this is a lounge space. And so they really talked about how it's more of an open-door policy that encourages dialogue, and it's no longer sort of sequestered. You can just sort of drop by whenever. I have to tell you, when I was here, we used to sneak into the counselor's office, hoping nobody would see us. Back then, a trip to the counselor's office was a, it was a stigma. It meant that there was something wrong. It meant that you had an issue. It is amazing now what a little redesign, some comfy couches, and chairs can do to really present a welcoming environment. But of course, I'd expect nothing less from lab school. Innovation has been this school's bailiwick for as long as I can remember, and I can remember quite a long time. As I walked around earlier, my eyes scanned the walls, the rooms, the floors, for anything that looked familiar to me. And suddenly, as I was looking down the hallways and looking at the students, there it was. I call it global gumbo. That's what I used to call labs, diverse student body. It's a testament to the school's sort of outlier status. Diversity has been labs bedrock from day one. The founders put a stake in the ground to be the deliberate, for that to be the deliberate, deliberate effort. That's why there's always been a mix here of races, ethnicities, diverse in income, thought, and social circumstances. Some call that diversity, but I frankly, global gumbo sounded better to me. Here, and feel free to use that anytime you want, here you have to look at all these different things. People are different looking. They're different sounding, different thinking people inside this very, very unique educational incubator. The name lab fits because a lab is where you innovate. It's where thought-provoking people carry out experiments, always testing, pushing the envelope to achieve a new level of success, and honestly, just to try to make things better. You know, as a teenager, I recognized the uniqueness of the space that I was in, and that I was privileged, I say that again, I was privileged to have a chance to receive this wonderful education. It's a private school because it attracts students from all social and economic backgrounds. It never felt elitist to me. Lab isn't just for the wealthy. Not everyone vacationed in the south of France in the summer. In fact, it's something you really wouldn't even talk about if you had. My classmates were more interested in where you hung out, did you learn anything? And frankly, did you have any fun? We dated whoever we wanted to date. There was never any pressure to conform. Lab extols the virtue of independence. That is why when you look around here, 
I don't think you're ever going to see any uniforms at this school. Am I right? I hear rumbling. Am I right? <laughs> well, if they're going to be uniforms, you're certainly going to design them yourselves. Some might interpret what I just said as tolerance, but that's the wrong word because you have to be intolerant first to be tolerant. When I was coming up at lab, I described the environment as welcoming. I started lab at age four and attended through my senior year, graduating in 1975. I consider myself a lifer, but I've heard that people who began at age three will challenge that assertion because they have that extra year. My daughter, Alexa Rice, who graduated, as we know, in 2007, she's a lifer as well. And one of the best things we did as parents was to give her access to this amazing education. Not only was it the school, but the community, really, that did it for me. I grew up in Hyde Park, I lived in Hyde Park until I was nine, and then we moved to the north side. So at that time, there was this sort of this north side, south side rivalry going on. There were prestigious schools closer to our home. Those shall not be named. But there was no way I was leaving Lab. My parents knew Lab was a great school and where I wanted to be. There was no bus, so I had to commute every morning. There was only one other student who lived about a block away who commuted. And I was talking the other day to a student um, who commutes from the north side, and he told me that the north siders at Lab are equal or almost outnumber the south siders that attend here. Boy, times change. As a matter of fact, he said that he drives past <coughs> Latin <coughs> Parker every day so that he could come here. And he, you know, he, I smiled when he said there are three Lab seniors that live about a block away from him, but they all drive to school separately. And I said, yep, that's probably the lab school independence. That's the way it works. So I, I may have been uprooted physically, but my educational well-being and my views of the world were shaped right here. And all of my friends were in Hyde Park, so I spent a ton of time here. And I wouldn't have traded that experience for anything. I mean, let's be serious. Where else can a girl who's five feet, four inches tall make the basketball team? <laughs> it's true, it's true. Yeah, that's right, that's right. <laughs> I, I, I have my hands. Again and again, my ambitions were met with generosity <laughs> and belief in me. I will give you an example. So every May we participated in a program called the May Project. I don't know if you all still do that, but anyway. It was like an, it, you got, it was like an educational sabbatical where you could pretty much do whatever you wanted for the month and present your experience to the class. So you're gonna laugh at me. I was on the tennis team too. So that's right. <laughs> So I love tennis, and I was such a tennis buff that for my main project, I told my teacher that I was going to play tennis in California for three weeks. And I remember him looking at me as if to say, really, really, really? You, you really think I'm gonna sign off on that? But he did, and, I, and here's why. <laughs> yeah. But I have to tell you why. I explained that I would write history of tennis from the African-American perspective. I talk about the poor conditions of tennis courts in disenfranchised communities and how that limits participation by black athletes. There were no Serena and Venus Williams back then, but I could write about their predecessor, Althea Gibson, a professional tennis player and pro golfer, who was the first black athlete to cross the color line in international tennis in the 1950s. And in 1956, she became the first African American to win a Grand Slam. And in the 70s, Arthur Ashe was making tennis history. He would become the only black man ever to win three singles titles at Wimbledon, the US Open, and Australia. So I used a connection in Ebony, I don't know how that came about, to land an interview with 
or for ash. Ash was on fire at that time. I cannot stress enough what a get that was. I add the ash interview to my paper on tennis. So you might be thinking I had an unfair advantage, but I have to tell you, you should never be afraid to use what you've got to get what you need. I was proud of what I had done. First, first of all, I cut a heck of a deal with my teacher, so that allowed me to pursue my passion. I showed the editor at Ebony, who I admired, what an enterprising resourceful reporter I could be. But it wouldn't have happened without my instructor and had they not believed in me and allowed me to make the most of that opportunity. It was 1975. Arthur Ashe had made history that year, becoming the first African American to win the British men's singles at Wimbledon. In later years, Ebony would write about how Ashe, beloved and respected by so many, had contracted AIDS the AIDS virus through a blood transfusion. The magazine showcased his AIDS activism right up until his death. Growing up in the publishing world, I felt a nearness to the news mess that shook black America. Because of who my parents were, John and Lewis Johnson, what they did and what they meant to the black community, and what Ebony and Jet represented to the voices of a generation. I remember when Dr. Martin Luther King and Senator Bobby Kennedy were assassinated. As a child, I think I was around 10, I cried for both of them, and I remember seeing my parents mourn them. My parents had known Dr. King and, Dr. and Senator Kennedy. They had the job, though, of articulating what these two brave men had meant to black America. I remember after King was shot, one of my favorite teachers cried in class that day. That may not be what teachers are supposed to do with us kids, but we got it. I saw the world not only through my personal lens, but through the lens of magazines. My parents created these legacy publications, an iconic beauty brand, Fashion Fair Cosmetics, and set a tone for black culture and style and media. It was an awesome responsibility. There were things about my childhood that were outside the norm for most kids my age. I was eight years old for the first time I traveled with my mother to Europe because she would buy clothes, fashion clothes, for a traveling fashion show we had called the Ebony Fashion Fair. It was a fundraiser and raised um, during its tenure about $55 million for African American charities. But she bought things in bright colors and things that you know, most African Americans at the time felt they weren't supposed to wear and didn't have the right to wear. And, you know, this wasn't for them. And, but my mother never felt that way. She felt that you should see and get and deserve the best. And I gotta tell you, she was the best negotiator I've ever seen. You would definitely want to negotiate with John Johnson before you would ever want to negotiate with Eunice Johnson. I mean, I'll tell you a quick story. I remember we were in one of these fancy fashion houses. I don't know where it was. Anyway, my mother, actually, when she bought the clothes, she had to write the check right then and there. Unlike other people who were buying, who would be invoice, no, not her. She had to pay right then and there. And I remember her taking out her check, and she was getting ready to write the check for this astronomical amount, but it didn't matter. She wanted the dress. And then I saw her fold it up and put it back in her purse, and I thought, oh, we got it. We got a problem. And she said, you know what? I just don't believe I like that price. Now, if you're on the other side of the table, you see somebody who's pulled out a check and they're ready to write, and all of a sudden you see them fold it up and put it in their purse, you're about to die. <laughs> you're about to die. Because now you've got to go back and explain why this sale didn't go through. And she got up and she left. And we left. We walked out. I said, what are you doing? She goes, just watch. She goes, they'll be back. They'll be back. We get back to the hotel, the phone's ringing, everything, I mean, they are on it. Because what they did is they called her and they said, you know, we do have the right price for you now. But she stood around and she got exactly what she wanted. So I, I, I use that as a lesson as I go through life. You've got to stand your ground for what you believe in and what you want. It is so important. So these are the types of experiences that shape me. But I have to tell you where I was truly brought up to be an innovative thinker, a progressive and a person who respects the differences in people 
Williams right here, right here in this environment. Lab didn't deal in cultural suppression. It flung the doors open to allow me to express myself. And although it was diverse, the black students at Lab were a pretty tight-knit group back then. I don't know how it is now, I'll find out. But that was okay too, because to bond with students living in similar circumstances was a good thing. So much of what was happening in the world the year that I graduated in 75 would go down to the annals of history. The Vietnam War ended. Bill Gates and Paul Allen introduced the first personal computer. I know that is pretty funny. Motorola obtained a patent for the first portable mobile phone. So you all don't remember these bricks, these brick phones? That was Motorola. Muhammad Ali defeated Joe Frazier in the historic thriller in Manila. And Saturday, suffering setbacks in the 60s was flourishing on college campuses. Black students protested police brutality and policies that unfairly targeted African Americans. Does that sound familiar to you? History repeats itself would be a cliche if it just wasn't so doggone true. Forty years later, we are still dealing with these same issues. There may be African Americans in this room who've had unpleasant experiences with police, or know someone, or a family member, or a friend who's had an unpleasant experience. There are non-black students and teachers here too who have stood with them, who've marched with them, have penned articles against discriminatory practices and policies. The ability to care enough to distill your anger your disappointment into peaceful actions that drive change, I have to tell you, you cut your teeth here on that. Through a challenging curriculum, an exchange of ideas with people who don't all look or think or live alike, through a code of conduct that holds an expectation of each student in lab to be intellectually curious. You are all equipped to be game changers. I have to tell you, my graduation ceremony, there were only 70 in my graduating class. That curiosity and fierce independence was on display, it was on fire. Some students marched in bare feet. Some had on those ubiquitous earth shoes. I don't think you remember those, but they were the precursors to Birkenstocks. So, you do understand Birkenstocks, don't you? Some went on to the, like, the full whole hippie thing with the, you know, the ring of flowers around their head and peace signs around their necks. Some donned uh, afros, had afros underneath their graduation caps and dashikis underneath their robes. So you can imagine, um, as I was going and moving on and graduating and the culture shock I experienced when I went on to the University of Southern California, I went to USC where I earned a degree in journalism, and there were 16,000 students there. It was an adjustment. It was a big adjustment. But I have been nurtured here by the curriculum, by the instructors, and by the gumbo. So I felt like I was a part of the school. I was challenged. The teachers here, I don't even have to tell you this, they pushed the heck out of me. They pushed the heck out of me. The academic challenges they put forth here really, really do stretch your brain. Honestly, some of my lab school teachers were tougher than my instructors at USC. You may not think you're being nurtured here, but you are. When you get out on your own, you'll start to realize what a great launching pad this experience has been. It's good to know that that mission, that launching pad, is still alive here. Now, I was able to find my tribe at USC by getting to know people and identifying common interests. I joined a club that brought musical acts to the school to perform. I should have been a promoter. The African-American students at USC were a very cohesive group, and you know it was really great. It's a little bit different now, because I graduated from the Annenberg School of Communications, and there are almost no African-American males in that school of journalism. 
So at me recently we established a internship so that we can help change that and foster that change. I have to tell you that we can lose ground if we don't work at it. Actor and activist Jane Fonda once said that people should be in a perpetual, a perpetual state of revolution. I think in today's vernacular, that could be said as you really need to, you know, really need to stay woke. Like Ebony and Jeff spoke for Black America, you have the awesome responsibility of being the voice of your generation. Lab is a school that deliberately tries to create these thought leaders. When people hear you're a lab kid, they expect great things of you. Now, we know lab schools produce more Golden Apple Award winners than any school in the state of Illinois. Yes, indeed. It is ranked the number one best private high school in Illinois. Yes, yes, yes. Some of our most prominent and respected modern day leaders in business, education, and politics are lab school alumni. You've got John Rogers, Arne Duncan. I mean, I don't have to tell you this. You, you, you know all this. You know, I mention all these followers to make the point that you're building a community here. You're going to form bonds that will stay with you for the rest of your life. Look at the student next to you. Make eye contact with them. They can be that's right. They could be making history, or even give you a job one day. <laughs> Everybody's getting real friendly now. Getting real friendly. You really need to count your blessings here. Count your blessings. Because you're privileged to have had this education. And I hope that you're taking advantage of everything that Lab has to offer. One student told me that the Ethics Club uses case studies to argue points in competitions. I told him we were way ahead of the curve on that. Most people don't learn how to use case studies really until they get to college. Another advantage of your proximity to being close to the University of Chicago. You are here to level up. This is a competitive environment, but it's not punitive. You're encouraged to work in teams, and that's a good experience, because you may be independent, but in the workforce, nobody really does anything alone. And before I finish up and we're going to do some questions, I want to challenge all of you to make a plan for how you're going to use your voice and what you've learned here to make things better for someone other than yourself. When I was in high school, yeah, we protested, but we still made it to the prom. So you can do both. Ask the tough questions, but prepare yourself so that you'll be able to answer the tough questions that are asked of you. I've seen, I've seen a lot of shoulders drop on people who could bring it, but really couldn't take it. I learned early on that it didn't matter what most people, that most people knew who I was, or who my parents were, or knew anything about Johnson Publishing Company when I walked into a room. That didn't keep them from challenging me. Your metal will be tested. You can absolutely count on that. Never, never lose your intellectual curiosity or ever allow it to be stifled. You have to commit to lifelong learning. Hold tight to your independence, but be open to change and other ideas. In other words, I want you to enjoy the global gumbo, but please don't drink the Kool-Aid. <laughs>